Hello, and welcome to the 20th annual, annual Brattleboro Literary Festival. I'm Starla Tronica. I'm a librarian and festival volunteer, and we are so excited today to present Mbolo Mbwe, author of How Beautiful We Were. You can submit questions to Mbolo via the question and answer button on your screen, it says Q&A. If your question has already been submitted, then click the thumbs up icon to upvote the question. There'll be links in the chat to purchase the book and donate to the festival. And a special thank you to our sponsors. And another special thank you to our introducer today. Luckily, today we have with us Claire Gillis, a historian and journalist and assistant professor of global history at Landmark College. She is also the chair of the Wyndham World Affairs Council, which is in its 60th year. And she is here to introduce our wonderful author. Claire? Hello, thank you so much, Star. Um, so I, yes, I, I'm here to introduce Mbolo Mbue. Uh, she is a Cameroonian author who's been living in the U.S. for over 20 years. She is based in New York City. Uh, her first novel, Behold the Dreamers, was published in 2016 and won the Penn Faulkner Award. And her second novel, How Beautiful We Were, was published this year. It tells the story of the village of Kasawa in an unnamed African country. Its waters and fields have been poisoned by the activities of an American oil company, and one of its native daughters, Tula, eventually becomes a revolutionary leader for her people. The novel weaves together the intricate layers of village life, the interconnected families, and shared social bonds of the leopard people. Uh, one thing that I really loved about the book was how all of the villagers tell their stories in the first person, you know, the, the narrator changes, and it created a sense of different time periods happening almost at the same time. I mean, being present with the individuals uh, in the story as they moved through their lives, and Tula the heroine of the book, I would say. Uh, she moves to New York City uh, for eight years to pursue her education. And I really like the way she always signs her letters home, uh, I'll always be one of us. And well, one of the things that I thought about a lot reading this book is uh, in a Eurocentric more Western tradition, the basic social unit or the basic uh, intellectual unit is always taken to be the individual, you know, the sort of person thinking alone, outside, disconnected from other people. And it's such a different uh, point of view that you get from mm. seeing these uh, village stories, how they all tie together and I really love this um you know the shared umbilical cord that's mentioned a few <laughs> times uh could you talk a little bit more I'll just start with that I guess um it, this is such an interesting tradition um when the villagers come together to basically to give their word for something to kind of make decisions uh they bring out the umbilical cords of all of their births that are you know just kind of together and it's this rich and also you know deeply bloody biological <laughs> connection uh to each other and yeah it ties together so many other things in the story too because of course it's it's generational it's you know generation after generation um and yeah those those are just some things i was thinking about but could you talk more about the umbilical cord uh tradition is this 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 is a thing that happens i wasn't aware of it <laughs> hi claire thank you thank you everybody and thank you to the festival for having me um uh, yes the um so this is a village in which um, connection to each other and to the ancestors is very important, right? There's a very strong sense of 
belonging. This is who we are. This is where we came from. We, this is this is this is what we stand for. There's a very strong sense of that, and and the umbilical cord. What happens is that whenever a child is born into a family, the umbilical cord of the child is taken and added to the umbilical cords of all the all everybody who came before that child, so that the child understands that they're not just an individual. Like you said, there's a strong connection. Like, you know, we are part of something. And, and so this is not the tradition that I know happens anywhere. <laughs> you know, it's not, this was my imagination because I grew up in a place where umbilical cord was very respected. I remember when I was young and a relative said to me that we had a family house and the relative said to me that all of our umbilical cords are buried in the compound of that family house so that we always know where we came from. So that is what gave me that idea, this, this sense that our umbilical cord, which physically is what connects us to our mothers, right? And so, and our mothers had umbilical cords which connected them to their own mothers. So this, this idea was to express how fundamental it is to these people that, that they feel connected to everybody who came before them. And so when they are about to make a vow or take a, you know, take a very important oath or do something that is really, really important, they bring out this umbilical cord bondo that has their umbilical cord and the umbilical cord of everybody who came before them. And they swear that on, 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 on this umbilical cord, they are going to do or say whatever they're promising to do or say. Yeah, and it's clear they take it very seriously. Yes. I mean, it's, it's uh, yeah. It, it's very profound. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, I was really interested also uh, about the role of Americans in your story, um, mm -hmm. because of course it's cast in the tradition of, of European colonizers and you know this these different extractive technologies and the Americans come along and say you know we're better we're different mm -hmm. um, and of course they're as rapacious and as <laughs> profit driven and as as disregarding of the safety of health of the the local people right um and then there's also this uh kind of other side of the Americans, the Austin, the, you know, the newspaper man who writes his story to share with America the, you know, what's happening and how the oil company is just poisoning all these people. And I'm wondering what you think of that, you know, uh, what, Tula says, or what is said in the book is, um, you know, all of these people who don't share the same blood as us, for some reason, you know, they're, they're worried about us, you know, they're, they're taking our story seriously. Um, what do you see this idea, you know, Americans uh, who are trying to save, mm -hmm. you know, save African people somehow, is that a flip side of the coin of this colonial or neo-colonial <laughs> extractive technology? <laughs> but, uh... Uh, <laughs> um, well, when you put it that way, <laughs> um, I, I think that, so my interest was not so much about Look at, the, look at what the Europeans did. What, look at what the Americans are doing or look at what you know, the, the Africans are doing. Like I was more interested in human behavior, in human complexity, right? Because ultimately when you look at the characters in this book, the Europeans who came before and colonized, the American oil company that came and took the oil, the American you know, um, nonprofit that came to help these villagers and the, yeah. the villagers themselves, there's no good or bad person in there, right? Everybody is it's all shade. It's all shades of good and bad. And, and my interest was more in power. Like, what do people do when they have power? And in this novel, the Americans, it's like, it's both sides because we see the Americans where the Americans had the power, right? They had the power to bribe or do whatever to have the device to, to take this oil in this village. And, they did it and they polluted and nobody could touch them because there was money involved and that is you know how things work in certain parts of the world but we also see american people coming to say this is not right what this oil company is doing we're going to try to fix it and so and then the people in the village who are gaining from all that exploitation and the people who are trying to fight against it 
And there's obviously there's a whole historical perspective to all of this, but my interest was more in examining all these different power lines, you know, the people who have power, what do, they do, what do they do with it? The people who are powerless, how do they fight against that, you know, to push back against their powerlessness? Um, and so even a character like Austin, who is an American and he's a journalist and he gets a chance to expose all of this, 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 uh, this injustice that is happening, he, he is, he also had his own agenda, right? He's a journalist and he's hoping that, you know, he can expose all of this is, you know, is what he does. And he's also works for a newspaper. So there is no, I, I wasn't trying to say Americans are good, Americans are bad or Africans are good, Africans are bad. It was more about human beings in a complicated situation and you having humans who are also complex. And what happens when there's, there's, uh, there's this oil at stake and there's lives at stake because in the novel we see the children are dying from all this pollution and many, many people have lost their, lost their lives. Um, and so I wanted to examine that, that interplay of power between the colonial masters who first came and the Americans who came later and the villagers who are all trying to push and see how given different circumstances and situations People will do things that you don't really like, you know, that doesn't exactly fall in line with who they, you think they should, they should be. Because the American oil company is not all bad. You know, there are times when they do, okay, maybe they're not so wonderful either. <laughs> but there are times where they try to do the right thing. Just as the African villagers, while they are suffering injustice, there are times when they do things that are unethical. So as, as, as a storyteller, as a novelist, right, I, I do not... Um, I, I am not in the business of, of preaching and telling anybody how to think. My interest is more in presenting human behavior and letting you make a decision for yourself. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Mm. Um, and um, yeah, one of, the, one of the other things that I thought about a lot reading this is the, you know, the complex interplay again you know what you're saying about power between the government of this country and the oil company mm -hmm. um because they seem to be you know uh tula and her friends and family they're you know as angry mm -hmm. at the government as at the oil company right and it makes me think of a lot of the um, you know, early post-colonial uh, liberation movements um, in Africa, in the Middle East, elsewhere, mm -hmm. often, you know, within a generation, especially if you have a, a strong man coming in, mm -hmm. uh, you know, quickly turn to dictatorships right. and, you know, enrich themselves uh, <laughs> as yeah. much, if not more than <laughs> prior <laughs> colonial <laughs> overlords. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and uh, can you talk a little bit about the figure, uh, the village leader at mm -hmm. the beginning, uh, mm -hmm. who right. is just very, I don't know, he's, he's very tricky, kind of. Right. Uh, <laughs> he's a very slimy guy, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, so, so the village leader and, the, and his excellency, who is, the, who is the leader of the country, he's the president of the country, right? Okay. They all, they all cut from the same cloth. So when colonialism came and then, you know, there was all, there, there, was, there was always, you know, who is going to benefit from this? The people who benefited from that, the people who are benefiting from systems of oppression and injustice and people like the village leader, you know, the village head, he's one of those people. He, 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 he takes advantage of the fact that he's the village head and he gets in bed with the Americans, so to speak. And from that, he gets to, benefit from the all world, whereas the villagers are suffering. And that is part of what is happening in the beginning of the story is that this village had been polluted for many, many years. And the village head is saying, I can't do anything. You know, it's, you know, what can I do? Meanwhile, he's living in a nice house and his kids are half jobs at the oil company and the other children in the village are dying and he's completely safe. So I grew up in a world where in it in it under dictatorship. I, in my country, we've had the same president for almost 40 years now. Right? Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> so when you've had the same guy for almost 40 years, 
you really get to see these things. And it's funny because before coming to America, I had never even never even thought about democracy. I was like, oh, you know, you just have one guy, right? I mean, I knew other people had democracy and they had elections, but it wasn't until I came here that I realized, oh, people can just fire their president and get a new president. Because <laughs> in my country, you can't do that. The guy has been there for like almost 40 years. Uh, but so it's... I think it's just that fascination with what I saw in America, this, all these freedoms and democracy and, and what happens when people actually have a say, as opposed to a place like a village where, you know, it is a dictatorship and then there's an oil company and then the village, then the village head is in bed with, with, with the oil company. What do people do in that situation? Like, how do people fight back? When really there's nobody who has their back. The village doesn't have their back. The oil community couldn't care, couldn't care less because it just wants to make its profit. And the, the government of the country is a dictatorship and they just, you know, they're also looking to make their money. And that is the whole, um, the big question when, in, when this novel starts, how do people fight against such a powerful system of oppression that has even their own government against them? Um, and they obviously come up with a strategy which, um, <laughs> is questionable because the strategy is in, introduced to them by the village madman. But the village madman tells them that we have to fight. We can actually fight and beat this powerful old company. And it starts this whole long battle that lasts for almost 40 years. And it's amazing that the village madman is the figure who spurs everybody <laughs> into action. It's like all of a sudden he's just taken the representatives of the right. oil company hostage right. and then everybody in the village is just kind of awakened and like, right. okay, we're right. just gonna do this. Uh, <laughs> Let's listen to the madman. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, but I just, to me, it was a celebration of madness. You know, you know this idea that, oh, don't listen to, to, to him, he's crazy. Don't listen to her, she's crazy. But the, one of my favorite quotes is, this is a great African revolutionary, his name was Tom, Tom, Thomas Sankara. And he said that, you cannot really bring about fundamental change without a certain level of madness. And because think about the people who have gotten us here as far as you know, this country or the world, you know, it's like that Apple commercial. Apple had this commercial many years ago, here's to the crazy ones, right? They had all these people who were, you know, visionaries, and there was the idea was that these people were crazy. They thought about these things that the rest of us didn't think about because they were crazy, and that is what got us here. So that is that that idea was part of the inspiration for the village madman. This person who is not given enough credence because people say, "Oh, he's mad. He doesn't really understand how things work. He lives in another world." And then he wakes up one day and he says, "What are you guys doing, sitting here and letting yourself be oppressed for all these years? You can't fight back." Now, whether or not they should have listened to him, that's a different story, right? When you get to the end of the book, you decide. <laughs> but, <laughs> but he awakens them, and I think that sometimes we need to to get to a level of madness to really believe that we can actually do something to change a terrible situation. Yeah, yeah. And if you don't have it in your mind that you're concerned about uh, propriety and just mm -hmm. kind of That's keeping right. things calm and, right. you know, yes, we'll go to the meetings every week with the oil right. company and think about it. Uh, you know, you can see so clearly these power relationships mm -hmm. and just, yeah. you know, the right and wrong uh, right. side of right. it. Yeah, yeah, I mean, and that is sometimes we just, you know, I mean, I grew up again, I grew up on that dictatorship. I saw the complacency. I saw how people said, oh, well, this is our life. What can we do? And, and it was the same thing in the village, right? There, there had been attempts to get something done, but overall people felt as if, what can we do? This oil company is powerful. They're just gonna keep on polluting and killing our children. What can we do about it? And on the surface, really, what can they do about it? But my whole life, I have been very fascinated by, by people who stand up to power. <laughs> you know, I am not one of them per se, but I wrote a book about them because I am fascinated by people who actually think that they can take on a multinational or a government and actually stand a chance at defeating them. And, and that is a crazy idea, right? If you think about, you know, civil rights movement, anti apartheid movement, they were all like crazy because as far as how powerful these systems were. It seemed as if like you cannot just bring them down. But they, they did, well, some of them are still working, but in certain extent, they did come down a certain, to a certain level. And so I, um, th this novel was born of 
from that fascination with, with people who actually believe <laughs> that they can actually bring down a system as powerful as you know whatever kind of system of operation they're living in. Yeah, the, I mean, they're just driven, uh, you know, I really, I like uh, Tula when she moves to the US, she's in New York and uh, she starts going to the village, <laughs> you know, the Greenwich right. village, not, not the village. village. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, you know, she learns about the people who are oppressed in America and mm -hmm. it just becomes this totally different thing. You know, if, if you always think of America as just kind of a land of democracy and, right. Freedom, right. and you don't know it, you might assume that people right. live generally happily and, and right. Without, right. Uh, right. structural inequalities. But of course, that's not how it is. <laughs> no. Uh, no, I mean, like before I came here, I was like, oh, America, I'm going there. It's going to be wonderful. And I came here and I said, oh, wait, I'm going to be treated differently because I'm black. What is up with that? Like, <laughs> Why? Why should I be? <laughs> like it makes no sense. Nobody told me this if I got if I got here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's gotta be that's gotta be a really rude shock. Um, it was. It was. I still am having a hard time wrapping my head around it, and I've been here for over 20 years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, well, we've got some questions coming in. Let me um let me take a look. Um, okay, so from uh, one of the attendees says, our book group greatly enjoyed Behold the Dreamers, and it sounds like we should be scheduling this one too. Is the village in the new book also based on Cameroon or an imagined locale? Yeah, it's a fictional village, and the country is not Cameroon either. It's a fictional village in a fictional country somewhere in Africa, but it's, it's clear from the novel that it is on the West African coast. Um, but well, it, is very, it, is, it is quite similar to Cameroon. <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, yeah, could you, I read uh, your op-ed in the New York Times about voting for the first time in 2016 mm -hmm. uh, as a citizen. And I wonder if, yeah, if you would want to talk somewhat about the, the last four years um, and this experience mm. in, in this country. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> so I so actually that was 2016 was the year I first voted. I was right after my first novel came out. Mm. And it was also the year when I went back to finishing this novel because I started writing this novel in 2002. And I spent many yeah. years writing it, and then I put it aside to write what became my debut novel, Behold the Dreamers. And then after Behold the Dreamers came out in 2016, I said, I have to go finish this first novel I started. So it was, it was interesting for me to, to, to finish a novel like this at the time when similar events were happening in America. Um, because, for example, in the novel, the, when the novel starts, the children in the village are dying of, from drinking poison water. And, and similar events, not the same magnitude, but children were drinking contaminated water in Flint, Michigan. Yeah, exactly. And, and so it was just that, it was almost a sense like I was writing a novel that was set in America, even though it wasn't, because these things were happening all over the world, which is what Tula says, because she thought, oh, you know, we are oppressed because we're living in this small African country and in America it's gonna be different. And you come to America and you see what, well, the oppression is dressed differently over here, but it is still the same thing. Um, and also after 2016, there were all these movements, the women's rights movement and, and Black, Black Lives Matter, they all became really prominent and gay rights movement, all of those movements. So it was very interesting for me to be writing a novel about a, about a movement, about people standing and pushing back when it was happening all over me. Like all over me, it was <laughs> all around me. I'm sorry, it was happening, and people were rising up and pushing back. Um, so that was a, it. Was a lot of inspiration, you know, just the climate change movement and the and the young people fighting again, you know, for better gun rights, um, for better gun laws. That was all. Um, it gave me a lot of fuel. I felt as if I was telling a story that was happening in in America, even though. Kosawa is, you know, a small remote village um, in on the West African coast, but the 
it's, it's still human beings we're dealing with here. It's still the same struggles. It's still the issues of power. It's still the issues of how to fight back against injustice. So that all um, definitely inspired me to finish the novel. Uh, at least gave me a lot of inspiration as I went through the last few years of finishing the novel. Yeah, yeah. And um, people stand up for their rights often. It's not planned out. It's mm -hmm. not, you know, kind of thought through. It's not a right. rational set of right. decisions. Um, right. Again, the madman. Right. Uh, it just, people come to a point where they right. just can't anymore. Right. And, right. and right. you know, it explodes one way or another. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, it does. I mean, and usually people don't even choose to say, oh, I'm going to stand up tomorrow and start a movement, right? It's as if like you're almost choosing because one day you're money your business and then the next thing you find yourself, you know, you know, giving a speech or marching at the front of a line. And I think that that happens to a lot. Of, think about the women in the, in the Me Too movement, right? Mm -hmm. Some of these women, they didn't even want to be, you know, to have a, be the public face of all this, but it happened to them and there was a chance to say something and they stood up there and they said it. So that is also another thing I wanted to look at, like how do people yeah, want to be how do people come to be um, in this position of, um, of, of leadership? Somebody like Tula, how did Tula come about to, to lead in this movement? Because she didn't choose it, uh, but by virtue of the circumstances, she found herself leading this, this, this battle, which was obviously a very, very difficult battle. Here we go, here we go. Okay. Okay. Oh, yeah, the tissues out. <laughs> sure Somebody. Coming <laughs> uh, hi everybody whoever is there <laughs> uh, one one of the questions is uh about the madman and this this person says that uh if the madman is the wise one this this sounds very shakespearean uh and the person's <laughs> asking uh if if you are a fan of shakespeare <laughs> Yeah, well, that, thank you. Yes, that was um, my introduction to literature was pretty much Shakespeare. Um, mm. I, 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 I don't know. I started reading Shakespeare when I was eight years old, living in Cameroon, and I don't think I understood half of what I was reading. But I, I, I we, we didn't need <laughs> <laughs> it. Like, has wow, this is great. I understand only one quarter of Hamlet, right. but this is wonderful. Um, but yeah, I um that was my introduction to literature. So maybe I mean there's even you know there's even like a tiny homage to uh to the Merchant of Venice in this book because it's one of the books that Tula reads because the character of Tula she's a great reader and and she she loved the Merchant of Venice just like I did. So uh. oh, lovely. How did you get the idea for this book? Um, you know I I didn't really think much about it. I just started writing it when I decided to start writing. So this is the very first thing that I started writing the moment I said, oh, I'd like to start writing as a hobby. So this is many, many years ago um, when I decided to start writing. And the only story I had in mind, the only idea I had was to tell the story of these people in Africa fighting against this American corporation. And I think, like I said, it's because I grew up with a fascination with revolutionaries and, and activists and dissidents. And it probably had to do with the fact that I grew up under a dictatorship. And I grew up in a place where people would try to say anything against the government were put in prison or they were, you know, some kind of harm came to them. Um, so as a child, I always wondered why, why people were being punished for simply asking for their human rights. Um, and it didn't make a lot of sense to me um, all the injustice that was happening. So that fascination with, 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 with people fighting back, it stayed with me. And when I came to America, and I never sought out to be a writer, I studied business management in college. But once I said to myself, oh, I'd like to start writing, the first thing I wanted to tell the story was, was of people fighting and pushing back, because it really was a childhood you know, thing, this, this idea that you know, I want to spend my life celebrating people who rise up and fight back. Like I just, I really, really admire it. So I will just say what I loved hearing you say, Mbola, was that this is a celebration of madness. I love that line. And, um, and I think it's something that, um, 
you know, uh, living in a wonderful, vibrant community like Brattleboro, I, I can so embrace that. It, uh, uh, that there isn't the sense of, you know, having lived in more, um, uh, oh, more uh, a homogeneous kind of uh, communities. I grew up in Iowa and, and many people were the same in the small areas that I live. And, and it is so wonderful to have those perspectives that seem like madness, like conga, oh my goodness, you know, that scene when he comes on with the keys, I was cracking up. And I just <laughs> said, yes, <laughs> this is exactly what we need. And we need that, that voice of madness, which is also rather Shakespearean, you know, just the, the, the crazy person that comes and speaks the truth. Um, and it's so, it, it, it was so lovely to me to see that. And, uh, and I, I think of so often um, the the best ideas, like you were saying earlier, uh, come from, it, you know, left field, as they say, mm -hmm. and, uh, and yet they're the ones with the most truth. And, mm -hmm. and how wonderful that is to see it, and, and see it play out. And, and, you know, sadly, it doesn't always play out the way we wish, but uh, but it is it's an important perspective to bring mm -hmm. to things. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I don't know whether you have time to read an excerpt of your choosing. There's yeah, we have we, we have some for appetite for that in the Q and A. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, if um. There are some people who would really love to hear you read an excerpt of your choosing. Okay, okay. Do you feel like you have time to do that, or do you? Okay, have I'll be right time? back. I don't have a copy right here, but I'll be right back with a copy. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, while while Mbolo is getting a copy of her book. Um, I will take this opportunity to say, if you go into the chat, you can see um, uh, that there is an opportunity to purchase books. There is an opportunity to see our festival sponsors, um, which of whom we could not do this without them. Um, and uh, also to donate, and we appreciate donations at any level, any level. Nothing is too small. And certainly nothing is too big. Okay, <laughs> and she's back. Okay, so I am going to, um, I am just going to read the beginning of how beautiful we were. This is just, um, just before the madman comes in. <laughs> um, we should have known the end was near. How could we not have known? When the sky began to pour acid and rivers began to turn green, we should have known our land would soon be dead. Then again, how could we have known when, we, when they didn't want us to know? When we began to wobble and stagger, tumbling and snapping like feeble little branches, they told us it would soon be over, that we would all be well in no time. They asked us to come to village meetings to talk about it. They told us we had to trust them. We should have spat in their faces Keep upon them names most befitting, liars, savages, unscrupulous, evil. We should have cursed their mothers and their grandmothers, flung pejoratives upon their fathers, prayed for unspeakable calamities to befall their children. We hated them and we hated their meetings, but we attended all of them. Every eight weeks we went to the village square to listen to them. We were dying, we were helpless, we were afraid. Those meetings were our only chance at salvation. We ran home from school on the appointed days, eager to complete our chores so we would miss not one word and the assembly. We fetched water from the well, chased goats and chickens around our compounds into bamboo bands, swept away leaves and twigs scattered across our front yards. We washed iron pots and piles of bowls after dinner left our huts many minutes before the time the meeting was called for. We wanted to get there before they strode into the square in their fine suits and polished shoes. Our mothers hurried to the square too, as did our fathers. They left their work unfinished in the forest beyond the big river, 
their palms and bare feet dusted with poison earth. The work will be here. The work will be there waiting for us tomorrow, our father said to us. We will only have so many opportunities to hear what the men from Pakistan have to say. Even when their bodies bore little strength, after hours of toiling beneath the sun, both benevolent and cruel, they went to the meetings because we all had to be at the meetings. The only person who did not attend the meetings was Konga, our village madman. Konga, who had no awareness of our suffering and lived without fears of what was and what was to come. He slept in the school compound as we hurried along, snoring and slobbering if he wasn't tossing, itching, muttering, eyes closed. Trapped as he was, alone in a world in which spirits ruled and men were powerless under their dominion, he knew nothing about Pexton. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, well, I think we are just about out of time. Um, if nobody else has any questions, uh, I don't know, Star, I don't know if you wanted to say something else, if you wanna officially close the session. I just wanna say thank you to both of you. This was so beautiful and I really enjoyed it. It made me enjoy the book even more. And that's the whole purpose of these things. So I encourage everybody run out, get this book. You know, we do have a copy at the library, but go buy it because you're gonna to wanna to pass it on to somebody and say, oh, you have to read this. And, um, you know, and a book group asked, you know, should they read this book? Oh, yes. There's so much to talk about about this book. There are environmental issues to talk about. There are wonderful characters. And, and like I said, you know, at the beginning when we were chatting before the session, you know, it's great because none of them are perfect. And, and none of them are completely evil either. You know, you, you see a backstory, they're, they're complex. And, uh, and I love that in the book. Um, and, and so I really encourage everyone, go get this book, go read it, and then come in to the library and tell me what you thought about it. <laughs> and and Bola, I'm so sorry you could come to Vermont to see our beautiful town this year, but please do come. And I look Thank forward to meeting you here you. or there or somewhere. Thank you. Thank you, Stad. Thank you, Claire. Thank, Thank you, you, so, you so much, Mbola. Thank Bye. you so much. Have Thank a good week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.